so I can see it too. Hopefully you can see it, yes? All right. So um, our first speaker here is Florian from Data Entry. He's going to talk a little bit about datometry. So you ready? All right, go. Go ahead. All right, thanks everybody for staying long. I'm Florian Wass. I work at Datometry, and I'm going to tell you a bit about Workload Manager, which is probably the most useful tool that you will get your hands on all year. We all love Postgres. I don't need to preach to the choir here. Uh, however, when you go to Fortune 100 or Fortune 50 companies, or maybe even the whole Fortune 500, you'll notice that, well, the love isn't exactly equally shared. And one of the things that we've heard over the last six to eight years that I've worked primarily with Wall Street and a couple of other firms, is Postgres is not enterprise ready. And that's a um, rather vague term, but it basically boils down to a long laundry list of things that I categorized in two large groups. One of them I call strategic challenges, and that is all about resource management and sizing and planning for deployment. For example, putting hundreds of clients in front of the database and carving up the workload so that 20% get uh, that bandwidth of the connectivity and 20 other percent of the applications get some other uh, bandwidth, et cetera. Uh, integrating with uh, LDAP servers in terms of syncing down credentials, what have you. On the other hand, um, what I call tactical challenges, and these are mostly the paper cuts. This is something like orphan queries where a uh, user killed the application and thought by just dropping the connection, hopefully the query will stop. Uh, and uh, uh, on the back end, it actually keeps running and eats up resources. Kerberization of connection pools is another great one that Wall Street is particularly uh, interested in. And then a whole slew that I call <coughs> emergency intervention, um, where DBAs need to be able to just stop or suspend certain connections, ideally without killing them, and all that stuff. So it's a very long laundry list. The reason why we know about this is because at Atometry, we actually built a data virtualization platform, and we ran into all of these issues. And so I give you the Atometry Workload Manager that actually addresses all of these things. Think of it as a Swiss Army knife for database connectivity, and it has everything from connection pooling to Kerberization of connections to LDAP sync caches, and so on and so forth. This is a short list of the features. More you find in the documentation. And uh, we're adding features uh, as we go. So if you have any ideas, any other kind of paper cuts or strategic challenges that you run into, please let us know. A tool that tries to make deploying and operating uh, Postgres simpler obviously needs to be very simple to deploy. And so the whole thing is very simple and quick to install. The default installation should take less than a minute. If you want something more complex and configure more elaborately, it still should be less than 10 minutes. And your users will not know about it. It's fully transparently between the application and the database. Neither the application knows about it, nor the database. It still gets better. Um, currently, we offer commercial licenses for all these um, MPP databases that are Postgres-based. But for vanilla Postgres, um, the system is free. Just go and download it, our way of giving back to the community. And my last slide, uh, if you have a laptop, open it right now. Go to this URL, navigate to downloads, and get the product. As I said, it's free for vanilla Postgres. And if you have any other system, talk to us. We'll be very interested in supporting that. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Way ahead of time. So next up, we have Quinn Weaver, who is going to be talking about SQL anti-factors. <laughs> I have seen the dark side of databases. <laughs> Terrible things, awful mistakes repeated again and again. And I'm here to tell you how to avoid those mistakes and the path of the dark side. The ubiquitous Vercare problem. These are, uh, by the way, simple problems that have nonetheless spelled serious doom for people. And we've seen them many times. Uh, 
people using Vercare usually Vercare 255 everywhere as sort of a habit. Um, you often see it in Active Record and other things that are trying to be cross-platform because text is a Postgres specific data type. And oh, oh, larger. Sorry. And it doesn't really buy you anything because all character types are represented internally as varlenas, a variable length arrays. Uh, so you're just getting annoying bounds checking that if you put something longer into there, you will get an error message. Possibly that's what you want, and in those cases you can use Vericare, just don't use it discriminately everywhere. And by the way, there are a couple of other ways to get similar bounds checking. You can use a check constraint, or you can use a domain, which is basically like defining a new type that implicitly has that check constraint, and then you can use it wherever you want. Uh, with these things, you can also have minimum values, you can have regexes, and other fancy stuff like that, although you might want to keep that in your app layer. Problem number two is confusion with timestamps. A lot of people look at timestamp without time zone, and they naively think, oh, that means like, uh, store this time value in a time zone independent way. But what it actually means is store this timestamp and totally throw out all the information about the time zone. Um, so if you have servers in different locations, this can play havoc with your database. Uh, if you happen to have, say for instance, a backup server in one availability zone or one time zone and the primary in another, uh, this can be quite painful for you. So what you actually want is timestamp with time zone or just timestamp TZ for short. Use it, it internally converts everything from your time zone to UTC or from the time zone specified in the SQL query to UTC. When you grab it back out, it converts it back, just works. One table to rule them all. So sometimes tables grow organically, they start out representing one thing, say an, uh, an email that's being sent. And then someone's like, well, you know, this message table, it could sort of have a phone conversation in it too, so let's just put that there too. So it's gonna be either one of these, so these have to be nullable, the sender and phone number and the sender email address fields do. Then we kind of have, if you're doing it properly, you wanna have a check that at least one of them is there. And you end up with ORs in your queries. That's the fundamental code smell for this kind of problem. Uh, another common code smell actually is that you have something like is not null or is null in your queries, since nulls are now in play. It's a little bit messy semantically, and performance-wise it's a problem because indexes don't really handle ORs. They handle where and and conditions. They figure out what rows to get from that. But when you're going through ORs, you just have to take all those candidate rows and go through all of them, seeing if the OR conditions apply to them. If you find that in your uh, query plans for explain and analyze, you're getting really big filter clauses, then that is a symptom in combination with ORs in your, uh, in your queries. That is a symptom of this kind of thing. The solution essentially is to normalize your tables have a, a contacts table, which has either an email address or a phone number, have a messages table, and then just select from the messages table and don't have to put the ORs in your query. This is kind of simplified because you probably wouldn't be using an ID, you'd probably be joining on a user's table using an actual username, but you get the idea. Uh, in closing, I am always collecting new tales of woe and darkness and suffering so please, if you have database anti-patterns, come and talk to me. Thanks. Yep, so. How do I flip the pin down? Yeah, here, I want to set. Just a manual type of because I just got the push that button. I uh, minimized the preview app. Oh. Um, well, where's the, um, where are the, where are the things? Yeah. Flip to his. His is marked O three. Okay. 
You can just use the back and forward arrows. Okay. okay. I just can go with them, with those yep. guys, right? Cool. Let me see. Yep. So next up, Alex from Springbok SQL is yes. going to be talking yes. about their uh, Postgres plus plus thing. Yes. So. Um, uh, Springbox is of what is it? Uh, database appliance. Essentially, having spent an entire career optimizing the SQL code, and I must look back now in my late 40s, and I realized I spent 20 years optimizing SQL. You know. I could have probably done a lot of different things, you know, maybe Java, but it's just something better than Java. But <laughs> I look back and I realized that most of my time is done. You know, and I realized maybe there's got to be a better way to make generations and actually. You know, put the data somewhere, extract the data, and just shorten this entire process, you know, so you don't have to constantly reoptimize. So basically, this is the direction where we're, where we're working towards. You know, build a fastest database appliance using the open source databases and compact in the smallest factor possible. So right now we're in one new factor, and we're gonna go down below one new factor. And I'll explain down there how it's gonna happen. And um, so appliance is fully optimized, and the DS service tree is certified. No mechanical moving parts. That means no spinning disk, virtually no spinning disk, no other mechanical components except the cooling fan. Down the road, we're going to get rid of cooling fans and just have complete design on the appliance and how it's going to happen. I'll kind of let you know down the road what, what do we have in place. What it's supporting today is supporting MariaDB, Postgres, Postgres X8, and Infobot. So, with this configuration, uh, you'll see uh, how it kind of came about and how it was in physics. It's pretty cool and very unique. So the appliance concept was born itself when we couldn't find fast hardware enough to process a transaction of data at the online poker company. So I'm going to roll with it because I don't have that much time. And um, we're now at the Media board. So the Radicon uh, nine, appli uh, nine appliances total, and two of them store data in columnar format. And that's where the Postgres comes in. <coughs> so on a single appliance, you have the rate of data stored in raw format in Postgres and a columnar format for Infobite. That means the transactional data is in raw format, and any analytics data is moved to the columnar format. So those, those were the challenges that offered. Large data set over the three terabytes, data stored in rows and, and normalized, queries taken five minutes to reply, and mostly it was no transactional data and not, sort of, not uh, optimized for raw based databases. So once we switched off to the columnar and improvised as a plug-in to Postgres directly. So once we captured, uh, switched to columnar, we started capturing data on HDFS. And uh, in the columnar format, over a billion rows only occupy 1.1 megabytes of total storage. Queries are, uh, were taking five minutes, so pretty much it continued. So we store a billion rows and continue to do so. And um, this is a quote from uh, VP of Engineering. It's if I were you, I would be scared to have your appliance tested for steroids, and that's sure it's extremely fast. <laughs> so I have two minutes more left with this. But basically the premise is, uh, single enclosure, you can store your data either in raw format or columnar form, which pretty much covers every <coughs> possible scenario that you can encounter in a data management. You know, aside from the NoSQL and things like that, you know, you can capture data and have a within same enclosure data in columnar and raw format, and uh, denormalize that data so into columnar format to explore faster analytics. Uh, the subject of discussion, row versus column, is a big subject itself, but you probably know if you do any type of data analytics, you get a lot faster performance in columnar format. This allows you to do both on the same basic explanation. And I have um, about one minute left. So uh, how does it look like? Standard one new form factor comes in three sizes, uh, no configuration, no tuning, um, turnkey deployment, no parameters, no installation. Put your data, start using DLP or whatever you want to use for it um, to make it work fairly straightforward. Uh, what the next generation is going to hold, next generation is going to become even smaller and it's going to become bit to cool. And by this, we're completely going to break a completely new ground. <coughs> the input code enclosure is 400 <coughs> times, it consumes 400 times less energy, and uh, it outputs very small amount of heat, so this makes a very clean technology. Basically, what this monstrous data center that you should see, because in first place, <coughs> you hit the data center with the uh, output from the servers. You can, if you put your hand behind most of the servers, you'll see the hot data coming out. You heat it up, and you cool it off with air conditioning. You're doing double the work. So when you switch to liquid cooling, you don't need none of this anymore. 
Because they're thinking about the image what they discuss later. Most importantly, you can eliminate the cooling fan. So it's less moving parts within the server. There are uh, ways you have noticed and, you know, gives me no time for questions, but thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have PG Pool. No, I'm thinking the PG Pool presentation. So, Melon. Aha, there we go. Do you want to flip over to his, the, the 04 presentation there? This one for the next one? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, running a database is one thing, but keep running is the most important things. And that is where uh, PG Pool and similar tools comes into picture. So, uh, I work for HP. I lead global database team here. And uh, we use PostgreSQL for running uh, some of the very mission critical uh, uh, applications for top five financial institutions in the US. So this is the real case that I have been using uh, to demonstrate the power of uh, PG pool and how to manage that effectively. So this is a real case study. So it all happened uh, sometime last year. Uh, it broke down. And, uh, that <coughs> excuse me. And that uh, our customer started complaining, and we are, we were in the verge of lo losing that contract with them. So we analyzed that. Uh, we didn't figure it out where the problem is. We looked into the log in various uh, other places. Uh, eventually came to know that it was all because of the memory overflow. So we started looking into much deeper, and we found that we tried to repl replicate the situation, and we, we managed to do that. And we found that uh, PG pool hung uh, all the time uh, on certain cases. And most of the time, we found that it was because of the memory overflow. So PG pool, I, I wonder how many of you have used PG pool. <coughs> Good. So PG pool is a wonderful product. It has it is, it is very rich, uh, feature rich product, uh, but it has a lot of known bugs even in, into the uh, current version. So uh, <coughs> oh, for, uh, clock is not working, which is good. <laughs> so what? <laughs> so uh, the way the PG pool works is that you need to have minimum two nodes, and uh, you can call it a primary node and the secondary node. So transaction happens on one node, but uh, queries can be served from both the nodes. And PG pool has got a lot of features. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go through that one later on, but before, uh, before I get into that, I need to explain you the problem with the PG pool. <coughs> Okay, so this was the easiest way to fix this problem, but really this is not the best way. Reboot the server, and certainly uh, it's not appreciated. So I'm going to explain you what PG pool does in, in nutshell. So uh, this is basically deployed to take advantage of the clustering system. Uh, what we do that, the way, this is the way it is configured, that uh, uh, writes things like create, update, delete, goes to the master, and uh, on the slave other sides, uh, it gets replicated, and queries like selects will be sorted by both. And it has got a feature of load balancing. So that is one part. And in case of one failure, uh, second node takes over, and that behaves like a master. OK, so these are the, uh, these are the four, four most important features of PG pool, and uh, we were using all of them. Connection pooling is the one. Replication is the another one. <laughs> Uh, that's the place most of the problems are. Load balancing is the third one. And limiting the number of connections you can sustain uh, is the fourth one. So most of the time, the problems what we had was replications. So what happens that two nodes becomes out of sync, and users will, will get served from one node, which is out of sync from other node, and they will run some report that goes to the first node and two different reports from two nodes. And that's the time uh, they start making noise, that what is, what is the hell going on? I'm running the same report, I'm getting two different reports. Uh, 
output. So what we suggested, uh, this is the one solution that we proposed and that works flawlessly. So here, no more PG pool. As such, we never had problem. We still don't have problem with the PostgreSQL or problem where all around the PG pool. I would suggest uh, use PG pool uh, for everything except that replication part. So, uh, so here, what we are doing here is using uh, uh, shared disk clustering architecture. There are two servers, call it active, active server and the passive server, and there is a heartbeat going on. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, <coughs> you, can use, you can create your own server. The one what we created was a Linux cluster server. You use that pacemaker, uh, you, uh, pacemaker to ping with each other at a certain interval. Once one server goes down automatically, the second server uh, takes up. Uh, and we were using the stand devices here, which was common to both the server. So, uh, the beauty of this one is that we managed to accomplish a uh, five nines AHA, 99.999%, and it has been running for almost 18 months now, absolutely no problem. With that, I will end. Yes, Thank you. Okay, so next up is Jignesh, who needs a terminal, yeah? Oh, okay. Is my browser readable? Uh, it's dark. Um, it's not, the terminal's not coming up. I'll let you do that. Yeah, I'm missing iTerm too, but okay. basically the same thing. Can you start two terminals in the browser? Me actually. Sorry, what is Two terminal sessions in the browser. Okay. Oops. <coughs> All right. Sorry about that. Yes. Don't delete my files. Have fun. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Over here. Just this out for a second. Just. Okay. okay, you ready? Uh, just give me one second. So I'm going to do a live demo and uh, trust the demo gods help me out. Wi Fi connected? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. But maybe not. Oh. Okay. Ah, Just go on to register. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, Jignet. What, what's the name of your company? Uh, the new company, uh, probably say right now it's a startup. Okay, Jignesh yeah. from a startup. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my name is Jignesh. I've been working on Postgres virtualization and uh, performance with Postgres uh, while, uh, for what, I guess like 10, 15 years. So, one of the common things I uh, have been doing is like whenever you get new equipment, you want to test out Postgres performance, try new things, and you know, setting up is takes a long time. So one of the things uh, I frequently use is a DVD store benchmark, and I want to show you uh, how to kind of speed up uh, deploying a, a DVD uh, benchmark and uh, doing a test. So quick question, how many of you have heard of Dockers? How many of you are using it? Okay, so I'm going to use Dockers to kind of say how do you actually deploy images and quickly run performance benchmarks using uh, Dockers and Postgres. So the quickest thing to do is uh, pull the Postgres image from a Docker uh, repository. You actually have a, a repo image for Postgres 9.4. Um, and then what you do is just run the image. Now in this particular scenario, you would see that I'm actually running on port uh, 5432 and actually setting up a location of where the image, go, uh, the data file goes and the Postgres user and stuff. So let's look at my PG data, it's empty. I actually now run the uh, Docker instance and it starts Postgres on that. The Postgres is actually running and it's created all the images. And now uh, what we do is I will connect to the Postgres and actually use my password that I mentioned and I can see that the database is created, which is brand new. 
right? Now, of course, uh, you have to use an app with your DB because the DB by itself doesn't do anything. So let's kind of like uh, uh, deploy a DVD store benchmark on top of it. So now pull the images again from the repository of the Docker. You got the image downloaded. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is run the uh, Docker DVD store app, the web app, and actually I link it to my original Docker image which is running Postgres. So it then figures it out, hey, this is the Postgres server that I'm gonna to talk to. I also say, hey, initialize the database because this is the first instance and uh, you need to initialize the database with the right schema database and the data on top of it and, and that's all you need to mention. Once I kind of like uh, deploy it, uh, let's look at the logs of that. You see it's actually initializing the data out there and at the end of it, it actually runs the web server of the app so now if I actually go back, uh, let's see. Oops, uh, the wrong thing. Okay, so I got the web running. It's uh, easily accessible. I can actually do login since I know the username and password of what that app uses. It shows that, hey, you're using the database Postgres uh, DS2 with the, I'm printing the password for your things to show that it's actually using the same instance that you've created, and then you can see that the actual DB is actually working by logging into that. Let's do it like this, if I, all right, it might take a while, but I'm gonna continue, okay. So let's say, hey, show me like four good movies of the category actions, and this will actually um, show you the messages, it comes up with four DVD images. So this is how the app, DVD store app works. We just show uh, like a quick demo on how to use that. Now, what you really wanna do is actually run a benchmark against that. So next stop is let's run actually a real load test. So I use the same DVD image, which is actually kind of like designed to do multiple things on it. So the next thing I'm gonna do is actually run a benchmark directly against Postgres using the same image. In this scenario, I, I kind of give this link to the same DVD uh, Postgres image that I have, and then all I have to do is mention the options and I actually run the command, and it now runs the um, workload. Now if I do like a top command, I'll see that it's running Postgres, it's also running my load. If I do IO start, uh, you'll see that it's also running the IO start uh, projects on it. So this is how you actually get like within five minutes, a Postgres installed, an app installed, the whole uh, load module, and you start running the test on it. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. You're, you're, you're next. Uh, Quinn, you wanna flip it to the uh, slide set six? <laughs> The next up is David with Terrapop. Yep, uh, my name is David Haynes. I'm from the University of Minnesota, and I want to talk to you guys about the Terrapop project, which has got data that you guys might want if you're looking for some spatial data. Um, it's free. We have, this project that I'm working on has one of the, um, lots of big data sets. We're going to be putting into this system one of the largest collections of international census data we're actually pulling in a bunch of environmental data like climate, land use, soil. This is all international data, um, land cover, MODIS data sets. And we also are digitizing most of the world's second level administrative unit boundaries for the world. Um, and so this project here, if you are a GIS person and you ever have to go find all this data, now you can come here to get all this data. Um, and to do this, we really use PostgreSQL for these sort of analyses. So we have microdata, so for each census um, across the world, we have information about like farmers in Chile and how much money they made in 1999. And you can find out that information from the microdata, and you can actually attach to that for each farmer, you can tell, find out how much, what was the climate in their area um, using geolocation. So we're actually using 
a lot of the functionalities that you have in PostgreSQL we're using for, we're actually using everything possible <laughs> to try and do this. Um, so right now we're working on using all the different um, functionalities. We're using the raster tools. We're using uh, column store for probably our microdata to, tr uh, to try and use these sort of analyses. Uh, these are the number of different uh, statistical agencies that we have data for. So this is actual census data. So you'll be able to get data about individuals from any of these countries. And we have partnerships that are ongoing to try and get more data from a variety of other countries as well. Um, we anticipate, um, because we work with a lot of the US census data, if you're into interested, really interested in big data, we have things like the 1940 US Census, which has 40 million person records. And so we're going to be able to have that so people can go ahead and start analyzing and learning things about that. Um, we also have a project that has one of the, um, we, we actually did a lot of work with trying to look at different countries around the world and getting all the data from censuses from all the world. So we have about 87 different countries with multiple time period points. We're going to be able to put in some algorithms that will do population projections in between those two things. So people, if you're looking for a particular census, a particular year for your sort of analysis, you'll be able to do things like that, um, as well as get in basic information like age and sex and things like that. And then you can make maps. Um, the other thing that was coming in um, that's really important is um, we do a lot of different raster data types. Um, this is kind of like the catch-all, everything goes in here, but um, right now we're going to be putting in all the MODIS land cover data sets um, from 2001 to 2012 at 250 meter resolution. Um, we do the projections and those sorts of things for you so you don't have to do this. You can just go ahead and go through a user interface and go ahead and download this. And fingers crossed, everything goes fine when we when I get back, um, this will all be available in April of this year. You'll be able to get any sort of this MODIS data available. And that's a MODIS satellite image. Um, so in the future data sets that are coming on, we're going to be adding in the climate data. This is a big climate data set um, for the world, half degree resolution. Um, we are actually interested in other things from different scientific communities that we can put into here. Um, that we're looking at. We have a 30 meter elevation model for the world um, that we're looking at putting in there and having different derivatives like slope, radiance, wetness index, um, harmonized soil database, geological formations, uh, the endless, the list is endless. So um, I'd be interested in figuring out what it is. This is our website. If you're looking for data, um, sign up. It's free. Hey everybody, so I uh, want to talk a little bit about crashing Postgres. Now, Postgres is a big, strong elephant, and a lot of people find it kind of hard to knock over. But I think if you want to knock over an elephant, you have to use the right tools. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the right tools are. Surprisingly enough, a lot of users have found the right tools on their own. Our first tool, as a matter of fact, is very easy to find because it requires doing nothing. Specifically, don't apply updates. Ignore all those pesky messages on Postgres Announce, keep running on that .o version, and just wait. Your elephant will fall over. We have lots of little fun patches for things like failures for database-wide crash or transaction isolation failures or all kinds of other things that can knock your elephant over. Um, the advanced player version of this is to run an EOL version of Postgres, one that we're not even releasing updates for, even if you wanted to update. Um, uh, you'll get lots of fun if you post a message like this on the Postgres mailing list. Uh, number two, uh, our second most common one, is out of disk space. 
Uh, first, install Postgres on a database volume that's mostly full. Don't monitor disk space usage and let the da database grow. Postgres gets really cranky when it can't write to disk. And e or you can do the advanced version of this, where you can do server-to-server -server data archiving, which means you can now run two servers out of disk space at the same time. <laughs> the other wonderful thing is that when you try to get yourself out of the situation in order to free up disk space, you need more disk space to run it. There's only a couple of commands that you can run that don't require additional disk space in order to free up disk space. Um, <coughs> so now that we want to free up disk space, let's crash our server by deleting stuff. Gee, we're completely out of disk space on the database server. Look at all of this stuff in the Postgres directory. Hey, there's some directories right there that have log in the name. I probably don't need those. You know, you get some really fun error messages when you delete that PGC log directory. Um, the, um, I, and if running out of disk space isn't good enough for you, how about running out of memory? This takes, is a little bit more complicated to set up. Uh, first, set your shared buffers to 80% of RAM. Set your work memory, your memory per query, to one gigabyte, and then ramp up to 1,000 connections. Or run Postgres in a cloud server and add a JVM and Apache mod PHP and MySQL and a second Postgres version. Or run Postgres on Linux 2.6 with the default memory management settings. Any of those things can get you some really fun crashes and error messages, particularly if they involve the OOM killer. Our final method here um, is another fun one that a lot of users find a lot is bad hardware. After all, we want to knock our elephant over. We need the right hardware. So buy some brand new hardware, install PostgreSQL, don't test that hardware at all, and then deploy it in production. Or deploy your hardware in production, don't monitor smart, don't monitor the syslog, and run it for three or four years. Either of these recipes is equally effective. Um, then you can get lots of other fun errors when uh, files on disk get corrupt. Postgres is surprisingly generous with his error messages in these cases, but unable to recover. So having learned these five techniques, we're ready to knock an elephant over. Thank you. Okay, and with that, it is the end of the Postgres Day at Phosphor G North America. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, it was a great day. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to hang out at the, they're having some sort of a thing in the exhibit hall right after this. Um, so a lot of people are going to proceed to that. Uh, but thank you for coming. Um, <coughs> all the videos are going to go up on the Phosphor G site. It's really up to the individual presenters whether or not they're going to post slides. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs>